listening to the Top Music Guitar Podcast, the show for guitar teachers to learn about the craft of teaching great guitar lessons that students love. If you're looking to start or expand your studio and make guitar teaching your full-time dream job, you've come to the right place. Each week, you'll get to hear from some of the top guitar teachers from around the globe and get their best tips and experiences so that you too can build your own dream studio. I'm your host, Michael, and I've founded one of the top guitar schools in Australia, written a best-selling curriculum, and I mentor guitar teachers. I'm excited to share my expertise with you and the wisdom of all the experts we interview. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Top Music Guitar Teachers podcast. With me today, I've got a real treat all the way from the good old U.S. of A, a classical guitar player, someone who's very well versed in the Suzuki method and has a wealth of information on all things classical, and that is John Cesar from For the Classical Guitarist. John, welcome to the Top Music Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very glad to be here and talk about Suzuki guitar teaching, about classical guitar, and just, I guess at the end of the day, just, just guitar overall. Most definitely. And I think one thing that first struck me, and I reached out to you as I think one of the first people to try and get on the podcast, it's just taken us a couple of months to make it happen, was just seeing how giving you are in terms of the content and knowledge that you put out there. And the fact that you commentate on a number of different areas of guitar playing, not necessarily just classical, obviously that's your area of expertise, but it's great to see your YouTube channel and your Facebook group and the content that you put out there is almost like an active live commentary on, on all things guitar. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think one thing that, um, is that there, there is sometimes is this big disconnect between like classical guitar and what you could maybe call traditional guitar. Um, but what I tell all my students, which I'm sure we'll get into is that if you can learn these things here, you can take these things and apply them elsewhere. And I also don't want students to feel like they should ever be limited with one thing. I don't want students to go in there thinking that they're only going to learn classical guitar. So I try to open the doorways for them to other styles of music, even if it's not so much playing them, just let them know what's out there and say, hey, you should, um, as they're getting older, you should really go out and check some of this music. Go out and just like read through some of these other method books just to see what's on the other side of it all um, and all of that. So, um, so yes, um, that's definitely a big part of who I am as a musician as well as who I try to be as a teacher. Fantastic. And you mentioned classical guitar and traditional guitar. So, for the listeners and even for myself, could you maybe explain the difference between those things there? Yeah, you know, funny thing is, I mean, I've been debating this for myself for a little while. It's like, what even is classical guitar? Is it the music? Is it this like playing on a nylon string guitar is it playing with your fingers i think at the end of the day though the consensus that i've the arrival that i've come to is that classical guitar is the way that which the music is learned right a lot of music in the more traditional sense is learned through like more of the oral tradition right where, you, where you're listening to music you're picking it off the record or you're having somebody show you it by rote but with the classical guitar, um, there is some of that, but really it's you get the sheet music and you learn to read from there and you use that as the primary primary pivot point to how you connect what you're going to play to what how you're going to play it. Awesome. And a really good differentiation there. So for you, classical music is the approach to learning in terms of uh, the tradition of sight reading, understanding the theory and translating what's on the page to the notes that you're playing. I, I think so. And I, and I think so because um, I think one thing that makes the classical guitar more unique than other, let's say, quote unquote, classical instruments is that in our standard repertoire, we're playing music from Brazil, we're playing music from Cuba, we're playing music from the US, we're playing all of that traditional classical music like um, like Bach and Scarlatti as well. There's adaptations of those pieces made for the guitar. But unlike other instruments, we have a bunch of influences outside of the classical world in our core repertoire. Um, and that's, I think, what makes classical guitar a bit, a bit more unique than I would say other classical instruments, definitely. Awesome. And would genres like flamenco or some of those, as you mentioned, uh, Latin American kind of countries that are played on the traditional Spanish classical guitar, do they still fall within the idiom of classical music? Um, you know, I don't think they do because I think a lot of those do, funny enough, even though they have some similarities, they do fall under more of that like oral tradition of like picking it out from what you're hearing, picking out from understanding the style. With that being said, though, because the guitar has a huge influence on those in those countries, 
we definitely will get classical pieces that were influenced by that style. Um, a very common one is the piece Astorius, which is actually a piece that was originally written for the piano. But the person who wrote it for the piano back in like the 1800s was writing it because he was so influenced by the Spanish and flamenco guitar players in Spain where he grew up. Um, so because that this piece that was made for the piano really became more well known nowadays as a guitar piece, as a classical guitar piece, because classical guitarists were like, oh, well, we can make a classical guitar arrangement of this. But a traditional flamenco guitarist would probably just play the original one. They wouldn't really go out and play the classical guitar version of it. Yeah. Oh, very, very interesting. Even I'm learning new stuff here. And I remember coming across, I actually asked my high school music teacher this a number of years after graduating. I just said, hey, what are three things that if you could help guitar teachers with when it comes to high school guitar players we're talking about? In terms of your high school guitar players, you know, uh, 15 to 18 years old, what's something you find that they commonly don't know about or have gaps in their knowledge or they, they have hurdles of? And she mentioned transmitting or communicating the intention of the piece. And I think that's something that uh, is missing from contemporary music or uh, a lot of guitar players' approach is putting themselves in the shoes of the composer and going, what was the intention behind this piece? What's the composer trying to communicate? What feelings are being associated with this piece? And as the performer, you know, it's my duty to bring those to life as intended by the composer. So would you maybe expand a little bit on that? Because I think that's something you're sort of hinting at, which most people are completely oblivious to who don't come from a classical uh, background. Yeah, I, I think that, funny enough, I think that both sides, um, there's positive and negatives to both both sides. What, what, from what I get from what you're saying is that, yeah, I think in classical music, we definitely have to be very informed because we don't really have much to listen to. We can listen to other people's recordings of it, but we also just go off the music that we're given. So, for example, um, let's take a piece by somebody like Johann Sebastian Bach, right? Someone that's like a big name, whether you're in the classical world or you're not even, people know, generally know who that is. And um, when it comes to learning box music, like, yes, you could go ahead and get the music and read the notes on the page and play it note for note. But it doesn't mean a whole lot if you don't understand, like, historically, are you doing the right kind of trills? Are you doing the right kind of ornamentations? Are you ornamenting notes that would be um, not ornamented? Are you playing an arrangement that has too many added notes? Or do you understand the kind of dance movement that it is? What kind, There's different kinds of jigs. Is it a French jig or is it an Italian jig? And, and different kinds of jigs have different kinds of weights on them. So we have to be very informed about what it is that we're doing. Which I think is great. I think that's something that's kind of what, what the music teacher was saying about guitar players. Because I think, I think generally speaking, we kind of just kind of like, oh, I got it. I can play it. But on the flip side, I guess to turn the tables a bit, I think one thing that classical guitarists struggle with then is we struggle with the listening aspect, right? We, we think, well, we got the notes on the page. We're very informed. We can, we can do it. Um, but like many classical guitarists, if you ask them who their favorite musicians are, they'll probably name all guitarists. And really good classical musicians, if you ask them who their favorite musicians are, um, they'll probably be naming good classical guitarists, that is. They'll probably be naming cellists and pianists and violinists because that's where we, we learn all the things like phrasing. It's very hard to phrase on the guitar. So, yeah, so I think both. And, but on the flip side, I guess, like, like if you look at jazz, jazz players, for example, like if you ask a jazz guitarist who are his influences, I bet they're going to say like Miles Davis and like John Coltrane and Charlie Parker. Um, so it's definitely like we, we need to pull a little bit from both sides, have the informative as well as just the practical, like listening to the music and connecting to what it is that we're hearing. Awesome. Really, really awesome stuff there. How would a teacher who may be self-taught or is oblivious to this whole world of classical but is interested in it, go about, you know, educating themselves or introducing their students to the ideas of, hey, this is a particular style of dance from the Baroque era and that was the, you know, intention of this music being composed. How do they learn about that? How do they get all the, you know, I, I even mentioned different types of trills and ornamentations and things like that. How do they go about discovering that world and then, you know, one, learning it for themselves and two, teaching it for their students? I think for them to do that, I think they need to put themselves in the student position for a, a, quite a while. It's, I mean, like many people think that because classical guitar has six strings and it's tuned the same way as the standard guitar, that, well, it must be the same thing. I can play electric guitar, I can play classical guitar. Um, and I think that's the mistake that many people make is that 
um, they're almost two completely different instruments. Like, yes, they have some similarities, of course, um, but the technique of how you play is different. The approach to how you learn and connect to the music is different. Um, and there's a lot of things that are just different about it. And I think um, it can be definitely be damaging to a student to have a teacher that kind of goes down the route of like, well, I don't know much about this, but I'm going to kind of just piece together what I think it is and, and try to share that information. I think a good teacher is definitely one that can um, admit to when they don't know something and be open to learning and be open to accepting that that just because they're well-versed in one thing doesn't mean they can do something else. Um, and I, I've been in that same boat myself many of times. If I have students that are interested in jazz, I can maybe tell them a few things. I can maybe say, hey, you know, these are some, are some records that I know are big records. Like I would recommend or I would say that anybody would recommend for you to check them out. But I'm also going to get to a certain point where I'll just say like, I, I don't think I can comfortably give you this information. I think you're better off seeking this information elsewhere. Um, and I think that teachers that want to do that with classical guitar, I think maybe they could do the same thing. They could say, well, here's some names that people know. Here's some baselines, techniques. Here are some books that people recommend. Here are some CDs you should check out. But besides that, I think you should find somebody who really knows this because I don't want to steer you in the wrong direction by accident. Awesome. And what, what advice would you have? I know you kind of just touched on it in, with your answer there is for the teachers who do feel like they've taken on a student who's, who might've started as a beginner, but now wants to go into classical or jazz or an area that's out of their specialization. Cause I think a lot of teachers find them themselves, themselves in that position. It's a very uncomfortable position to be in with a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, are you asking like, what should the teacher do? Yeah. I think that they should, uh, like I was saying earlier, I think they should go out and seek that information. I think they should go out and help find help find it. I think I think one thing that we're lucky in any area of music is we get to know people that are good at things. Even with if you take certain kinds of guitar playing, like there's some people that kind of do a little bit of it all, but some people that you know like all they do is they play blues and rock guitar. Like and they've and they may may know way more about that than a person who just plays a few a few blues and rock songs and maybe an okay solo soloer. And, they, they, and if you have the connection there, you might be able to say, hey, look, I have this student, like I taught them a little bit about blues, but like, you know, I'm really getting out of my comfort zone. Do you have any opening in your schedule? And then there's like, hey, you know, I talked to my friend and I think they can help t t take you further along the way and then help make the connection. So that way you're there to support them. You're there to help them transition, um, but, you're, but you're also not hindering their learning experience by doing something you're not maybe totally qualified for, at least not totally qualified for in that moment. Yeah. Very cool. And how does someone know when they're ready to become a teacher in terms of they might have been playing for a couple of years, but I do often see, and apologize, apologies to yourself and any other um, <laughs> yeah. teachers listening to this, but often you know, some classical teachers from my perspective and my own experience are often sometimes lumped in as being pretentious or being elitist and it often goes in the, in the jazz world as well. So, uh, and a lot of those guys are saying, Hey, you've got to be playing for this long before you teach or have this much experience. So do you have any thoughts you can share on, on what qualifies someone as being ready to become a teacher in general, and then even to go into specifics of classical or jazz or a particular niche? Yeah, I think I think what makes somebody qualified to be a teacher is if they can convey the information in a way that um, somebody who's coming at it from an outsider and a beginner point of view can understand. Can they can walk away with feelings like they accomplished something? I think I'm sure, as you know, with any kinds of um, guitar playing, but also any kinds of feel, any field in general, there are so many people that are great at it and they can't teach at all, and they could be like the best whatever it is. Whether it's a lawyer, they could be the best I don't know, surgeon, they could be the best guitar player. And they can't teach, right? Uh, and I think what qualifies them for the be the teacher isn't necessarily their own accomplishments or so much about um, what they can do. I mean, to a certain degree, yes, they have to have done the thing in order to teach it sometimes. Um, but I think more importantly, it's just can they convey that information to a student and have the student walk away feeling like they learned something? What I tell my students is that um, if you can explain to me what you need to do and why, then that shows that you know that thing really, really well. And I think that if they're do those, those teachers can think of it in the same way, then they can do it. However, I think also that, like you said, there is that kind of that pretentiousness of like in the classical world, especially, right? Not so much for the guitar, luckily, but definitely in like the violin and piano world, from what I've seen at least that like, well, you have to have won these competitions. You have to like 
be able to play. You have to have this proficiency on like this book or whatever. You have to pass these like certification tests through this like um, teaching accreditation school. And that's unfortunate because there's many people there I think that can teach very, very well if they can't do things to a certain point. And some people might be great teaching the beginner level. Some people might be great teaching the intermediate level. Maybe they can't teach that advanced level yet or, or ever, but they're great teachers and they can definitely help the student get from nothing to there. And then when they're there, if they're a good teacher, they can, they can do the same thing where they can say, hey, look, I know I'm a classical guitarist, let's say, but you know, you should really be going to study with somebody who's like teaches students more at your level now. I think I've done, you've gotten all you can get from me. You need to go find someone that can do better. And I think sometimes that's obviously hard as, for the student, but I think it also helps the student hopefully down the line have more respect for that teacher to, to, that they did what they felt was best for them, even though they could have just kept teaching them. Awesome. I'm sure a lot of teachers will be relieved hearing what you've just said <laughs> then. And for, for any people who are listening at home, John is absolutely correct in saying as long as you can effectively communicate what you need to to the students and they can leave that lesson or go home uh, understanding what they need to do, they've had a breakthrough with a concept that they've made some sort of improvement from lesson to lesson, you can be a teacher. Now, I don't recommend being just one step ahead of your students. There's, that's a very bad position to be in and very, very highly stressful. And you should always be working to better yourself and understand more about your craft and your knowledge and get better at your instrument and your communication skills. But as long as you can help someone, then you can help someone and you can go forward and teach. And whether you're a primary school, uh, maybe elementary music school teacher uh, over for our listeners in America, like you might not be ultra proficient. In fact, you might have been a classroom teacher who just took a, you know, a, a couple of weeks of lessons at university as part of your qualification to become a classroom teacher. But your role is helping build a love of music and appreciation for instruments is just as important as, you know, a, a classical maestro has getting advanced students to reach their maximum full potential. It just whereabouts in the journey of that particular student do you fit in? And as long as you are helping them get from A to B uh, or you might be getting from A to B and another teacher might get them from B to F and another teacher might get them from F to Z or whatever it happens to be. Uh, it's very rarely that you have to take a student uh, you know, across a 30 year span and grow up with them. You just work to your capacity with them. Exactly. I, t I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Now, John, what I really want to ask you about is this Suzuki method. Yes. Uh -huh. That I, I know you are uh, very familiar with and, and teach. And it's something which I've heard about. We learned about it in, uh, I think, high school. We watched a video of it in a music class one day. And uh, it was always something that I had heard of in the context of violin, but never piano or any other instrument. And now all of a sudden I'm seeing it everywhere for guitar. So, for the listeners who don't know anything about it, can you give us a crash course and introduction to Suzuki method? Yeah, so I'll probably give you guys what I um, what I tell any new Suzuki family, and I guess the first thing to preference uh, preface that with is Suzuki family. So Suzuki is very family, and we could say team almost oriented. The team consists of the teacher, the student, and the parent, which makes what we would call the Suzuki triangle, where our goal as the parent and teacher are to support the child, which is their goal is to obviously walk away learning and having a nice appreciation for music and whatever instrument they're learning. The Suzuki method uses what's known as the mother tongue approach, which is basically when you learn music in the same way that you would learn to speak your native language. This is done through listening and imitation and also positive re-encouragement at, positive encouragement at home. So, when the student leaves the lesson, the parent has the role of being what's known as the in-home teacher. And as the in-home teacher, their job is to help the student do all the things that did in their lesson and, just, and help also encourage the student by making it a positive experience at home. Parents who I've seen be the most successful with this are the ones who help the student designate, designate practice time and listening time every single day. Of course, when you're first starting, it doesn't have to be a long time. I tell parents um, after the first like even month of lessons, practice might only take 10 or 15 minutes, but those 10 or 15 minutes every single day are crucial for the child's development. Making sure the parent is making, making the child listen to the recordings every single day. Also, super important and crucial for the development of the child. And that's what makes the Suzuki method kind of work. It makes I guess separates them from the traditional method is the way the students learn, the parent being involved in the lesson, taking notes and being involved sometimes, and the parent acting as a teacher at home. The other thing that separates it, I would say also, is what's usually enforced, if not almost um, very, very, very highly encouraged, is the group class element. 
Students, in addition to the private lessons, have group class elements. This allows us to go over some things with the students that they can't normally do in a lesson, right? Things are just better to do in a group. And also, it allows the students to be encouraged and also feel that sense of community when it comes to playing music, right? I think when students do other things, other activities in their life, whether it's sports, whether it's like track and field, whether it's um, here we have like Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, right? Whether it's some other activity, part of what makes them enjoy so much is getting to see their friends, getting to do a shared hobby and interest with their friends that they like and also making new friends. And in guitar lessons, at least normally, it's very unfortunate because it's just like you go to your lesson, show up, hang out with your teacher for half an hour, go home, and then the same thing next week. The group class element definitely eliminates that and it also allows students to build social skills as, uh, and also allows them to build music skills and having be, being learning how to play music with someone else while they're still learning to play music, which I think is a huge, a huge element of what makes it work so, so well. Um, but yeah, that would be my brief rundown of it. Yeah. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, I've learned a whole bunch of new stuff about it already. Now, you mentioned, um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to pick your brain about all this kind of stuff there and unbox what we've got here. So a big component of it is having the parent learn alongside in the lesson as well as uh, facilitate that at home. Was that correct? Yes, correct. So would the parent be uh, learning the instrument alongside the student in the lesson or just observing and then uh, uh, repeating the instructions at home? You know, with this part, everyone does things a bit differently. I've seen successes um, both ways. I can definitely tell you that the one I've seen the most success of is I tried this last year with some of my students where I had the parents come for four weeks of lessons privately before their students started lessons. This allowed the student to get encouragement because that made them that made them want to do the thing that the parent was doing. As you can guess, little kids love seeing their parents do something that's new and cool and makes them want to do it more. So you're already furthering a more of a desire and a want to learn. And they're also watching the parent learn correctly. They're watching the parent struggle. They're watching the parent have um, understanding that these things are going to be difficult, but they can, there's a challenge that can definitely be overcome. And um, so I would have the students, the parent come for a half hour lesson. The students sometimes would come in and just sit on the side and they'd be playing games. Sometimes they just sit and watch because they found it interesting. And then once the parent was able to do a certain amount of skills, such as even little things, just as how to hold the guitar correctly, how to get a good sound. Then when the student took lessons, one, the student already had the encouragement of seeing mom or dad do it. And number two, the student also has the parent who went through the same things and it builds a strong connection. The parent can be like, oh yeah, that's really hard. But um, I remember um, I got through it. I think I, I can help you do it too. And also, of course, it strengthens that. However, I've also had families do very well who haven't done that where the parent just comes in and they kind of just take notes and I make sure that mom or dad understands like, hey, this is how the notes should sound. This is how the technique should look. This is how they should be holding the guitar. And some parents do a great job with that. But I definitely have seen more success with the parents who do their lessons privately for a little bit because they really know what, what they're getting themselves into and what they're getting, their students are getting into um, when, when they do that. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Uh, I can see how it would just nurture the relationship with uh, you know, the, the the parent and the the kids as well, and also you know show the kids a bit of resilience, and also show the parents that some realistic expectations. I find that one of the biggest challenges you have as a, a teacher is the parents will often go, "Okay, why can't they play the song and make it sound like the recording?" And you go, "All right, well, did they score forty points like LeBron James did in basketball on the weekend at their kids' game?" It's an unfair comparison, like you. Know, Music takes years and years to build up skills. Uh, but having said that, every Suzuki sort of player I know, well, their method is renowned as getting really fast results for students. So what are, what are some of the keys of having the students progress really rapidly? Or what are some of the advantages, in your opinion, about the Suzuki method over a standard approach? I think the big, big advantages would, just, would honestly be the things I listed earlier, such as like the listening, for example. I think one reason that students have a hard time early on is they're learning, and again, Suzuki students are starting pretty young, but they're learning how to hold the guitar, how to play the guitar, how to listen to music, and how to read music and play what you're reading all at the same time. That seems too too much. And the comparison I made to parents is like, we wouldn't, learn, like, as soon as a child learns how to say their first word, we don't start them off reading, but like short books even, right? We wait until they're actually pretty fluent and pretty comfortable with speaking whatever language you're speaking. And then once they do that, then we say, well, why don't we read like a very easy book, a book that's way below your level of 
you know, level of speech, but that you can read comfortably because it's words that you recognize. It's words that you know. And then we can kind of start having them go from like you're speaking and you're reading to being like you're speaking and you're reading, you're speaking and you're reading until eventually they're kind of paired up, which I think is the big thing is the students aren't getting overwhelmed by all this other stuff that they have to do. And I think because of that, it allows them way more time and much more attention in the lesson and in practice to focus on their tone, focus on their technique, focus on the things that they're doing. And then when the reading comes in, they're reading things that are so below technical what they can do, they can be focusing purely on the reading. And I think that's one thing that allows the Suzuki method to really get real good results. But I think the biggest thing really is, is just that like positive, that positivity, as well as the structure that the parent provides them at home. Because like little kids, especially like six and seven year olds, they're not going to know how to practice. They're not going to know guitar practice for 15 minutes means do this thing correctly four times, but look out for this, 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 and this. No, no kid is going to know that. But if the parents there to remind them, then then I think they they have a much more of a chance. So I think those are the things that make it definitely make it better. That's really really awesome stuff, and this stuff is just resonating with me so much. And everything you've said about uh, you know people trying to multitask too early. Uh, I always say it's kind of like driving a manual car. You got one hand doing this, one hand doing that. You got the feet doing different things, and you got to try not to crash into things. That's what trying to get your students to sight read music while learning where to put their fingers, while trying to figure out which dot means which note. It's just way too overwhelming in the beginning. So, yeah, it sounds like everything that you're talking about within Suzuki and just focusing on one skill and getting them fluent with the speaking as opposed to the reading and writing, which we learn to quantify much later in our language developmental skills is just so spot on there. Now, you mentioned the students do a private lesson and a group lesson. So is getting students to come multiple times a week or even, I guess, back-to-back sessions sometimes, how do you sort of arrange that for your students? You know, I think it depends on where you're at. I think it's definitely tough if you're a new Suzuki teacher, um, especially especially when there are expectations of or standards that other studios set, set up and build for you. I was lucky in that when I first started doing my Suzuki teaching, I got hired at a school that already had an established Suzuki program. And because the program was already established, it was very clear that, hey, if you're going to sign up for lessons here, this is how we do it for everybody in the program. And it was, and at that point, it was kind of like, oh, okay, well, we'll do that definitely. I think that if you're starting out, it, can, it, might, it might be hard because you might say like, oh, well, lessons cost this much, but you're paying this much because you're paying for a half hour private lesson and you're paying for like a 45 minute group class. And parents, some parents will ask like, well, how come we, we took, my friend takes lessons over at this place, like one town over and they don't do a group class. How can, can we, do we have to do the group class? And then there becomes this whole thing of like, well, yeah, but that's a different approach. I think though, if you, with anything else, I think if you stand your ground and you wait for, and you build the results, eventually you won't have to worry about that anymore. And, and, and then worst comes to worst, you can, if the parents are really against it, uh, once you get to a certain point, you can just say like, well, that's fine. You can go take lessons there then and leave it and leave it at that. But, but yeah, no, I was very lucky that when, in me and anyone else listening, I guess, if you do get a job teaching Suzuki, I would highly recommend for you to go into a Suzuki school first, like a, a place that already has a Suzuki program, because they can definitely help you enforce those things. They can definitely help, definitely help some of the backlash. They can be like, well, look, this is how our students sound. This is why they sound that way. If you want your student to be part of this program, this is how this program works. Um, but once you, once you build up a good studio, once you build your results, um, parents, parents get to see your studio, they're not going to question if they have to do the group class anymore, they're going to understand like, well, that's part of why this works. So I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Awesome. Really, really cool stuff. And it's amazing how some parents just resist the idea and understand everyone's got a budget they got to stick to. And not everyone has, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, excess income to throw into guitar lessons. But I remember almost every sport that I ever did, if you didn't do it two or three times a week training, then you didn't make the team. But for whatever reason, I don't know if this is a universal or just here in Australia, like sport, two, three times a week minimum. But music, 30 minutes once a week uh, is is the what everyone does. And that's just the expected standard. So um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was actually just going to comment. I mean, that's why I tell, tell the, the parents all the time. I tell them that like, um, especially as students get older and their sports are getting more serious, I tell them like, well, like, look, if they sign up for like soccer when they get older, they're going to have to make the practices or else they're not going to be able to come. I, this is more so about practicing. Like I tell them like, 
when you guys you sign up for soccer sometimes the mom will be like oh we, we couldn't practice that much this week um it was a really busy week um we had this we had this i'm like well yeah but during this busy week you still got them to like their hour and a half soccer practice you still drove them there this is less time you don't have to leave your house and i think the thing that's happening is you're just not treating it with the same level of priority again certain things take certain priorities over other things but the key word there is priority. If they make, if they go on their phone right down their calendar, practicing guitar for 15 minutes Monday from 5.15 to 5.30, then it's much, much more likely going to happen than if they just say, oh, we'll practice sometime tomorrow. We'll figure out when. We'll see. We'll do when we have some free time tomorrow. Because as you probably know, that's not going to happen. So, so yeah, I think that um, yeah, sports definitely have that big commitment. And I think I tell them like very early on that guitar has to have a similar kind of commitment, not just not maybe not similar time wise, but the mentality to commitment has to be there in order to get in order to be successful and have and have results. Most definitely, yeah. that's really really cool stuff in there. And, and guitar teachers and music teachers listening to this, just keep on fighting the good fight. Just keep on trying to educate your parents and uh, your clients on the importance of prioritizing what this is. And yeah, guitars, the, the thing we shoot ourselves in the foot with is our own expectations. We love guitar. We probably resonated with it from day number one for most of us. Uh, we made it in our top five priorities for most of our life. For the average person, guitar is lucky to be, you know, in the top 10. It's generally going to be somewhere between 10 and 15. And that's only while there's disposable income, while there's a secure financial situation at home, while the home situation is good. So, you need to con uh, convey the importance of practicing regularly, of uh, attending lessons multiple times a week wherever possible. And that, yeah, if you want to sound like the pros that they listen to on the radio, that's the product uh, of you know 10,000 hours of hard work or a decade of hard work of practicing. If you want to get to that level, you have to put in the time. And what, uh, 30 minutes once a week is less than 1% of your waking hours. Would you expect to get good at anything? I always say to my parents, uh, oh yeah, he's he's not really doing well on guitar. I'm like, oh, well, how much is he practicing? Or oh, not much. How well does he go on in maths and English? Statistically, he's probably going to be, uh, you know, average <laughs> as most people are in their maths and English. And that's with five hours of classes a week at school. You know, you do an hour of maths, an hour of English every day at school. Most people are still pretty average or pretty, pretty mediocre at their maths and English skills. So how are you expecting that we're going to get really, really good at our guitar uh, on the same kind of, um, you know, small amount of time there? Definitely, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that that's um, that's actually a great comparison. I mean, I know I've never thought of it, but yeah, definitely comparing it to what we do in school. Like, we only go we go to school five times a week because if we don't, it wouldn't make sense to go to school like twice a week, but all day, like twelve hour twelve hour school days, and then having a few days off. So yeah, I, I totally love that comparison. I'm definitely gonna definitely gonna use it um here and there. Now we've got a ton of other really cool things that I want to ask you about, but I'll wrap it up with just one or two more points about Suzuki. It's always associated, at least where I see it with kids, is there like an adult equivalent or are there some principles from Suzuki teaching we can apply to lessons with our adult students? Yeah, you know, I, I've been toying around with this idea. I mean, one big thing with the Suzuki that I guess I should have mentioned earlier that I like a lot is that the repertoire is all the same. So, my students can go to any Suzuki festival anywhere in the world, at least anywhere that does it, right? which at this point is pretty worldwide. Um, and they can go to any Suzuki guitar event and they can hop in and the teachers there are going to know exactly what pieces they're playing. They're going to know exactly um, more or less where they are in their development if they're on that piece. And uh, they're going to go ahead and meet kids that are playing from all around the world, playing the exact same pieces as they are, which is really cool. But as a teacher, what makes it good is I can get, I can master those pieces. Um, well, you, you, you master, or you learn the pieces very well and how to teach them um, through book trainings. So, um, what's great for me as a teacher, which I think makes it better, is I've taught like some some pieces. I've taught the same piece at least ten or fifteen times before, so I know all the ins and outs of exactly what the students going to have trouble with, and know how when when they're going to have trouble, and know why they're going to have trouble. I can try to give them like preparatory exercises two weeks before they even get to that song, so that way they're like really ready to go, and I can also help them fix those issues before they then become big, bigger issues. And it's really great because it makes it way easier for me. I have a lot less work to do. Um, I can just think, oh, cool, you're on this one, you're starting this one next. Why don't we do this technique today? Because it'll be a good and we'll make a little prep exercise for it. And I think um, what, what's good about that is that then myself as a teacher, I know exactly obviously how to play them and then how, how to work in them and things that I find for myself. 
So to answer your question, though, does it work for adults? I think it can. I've definitely used the Suzuki repertoire with my adult students because I know it so well. I think all the songs in the first few books, I have just songs down from memory, from playing them and from teaching them. So with my adult students, I know exactly what to do. If they're working on a piece, I can say, oh, well, cool. And let's, let's play this one together. And I can just play it right away without need to pull up anything on my phone, pull up any sheet music or anything. Uh, we can just kind of go for it. And I think that um, that doesn't really use the approach, but I think the, the repertoire is kind of the key thing there that's kind of pretty useful because repertoire is so systematic. It's so well built. It's like you learn one song. This song uses this new note plus this new technique. This one technique you use in this song, keep practicing it because in three songs, you're going to have the technique used again, but it's going to be even more. Um, so I use repertoire just because I think it's really familiar, as well as some of the aspects of listening instead of having to learn for learning things by um, by reading it off the sheet music. And I think adults find that easier as well because it definitely gives them, just like kids, a lot less to worry about. It, like you said before, it definitely eliminates some of that extra multitasking that they have to do. So yeah, I think it can work for adults, obviously minus some of the like the group class and the parents element. But honestly, adults like being in groups too. So actually, the group class can, can probably stay, just the parent element, obviously. Very cool. Very cool. And what concepts or principles... Uh, in the underlying Suzuki method could be more broadly applied to teaching in general outside of the Suzuki program itself? I think that the big thing is, would be the listening. I think that that we definitely need more of. And I think, funny enough, that's actually something classical teaching needs more of. I think that we actually do a lot of listening with when I used to teach rock and pop. Like, I think the cool thing there is students would kind of have to do the listening on their own, which is always cool. Like, they would come in, they're like, oh, I heard the song on the radio, I love it. and Or like, if a certain song is like really big on a TV show, they'll go onto YouTube and listen to that song like over and over and over, and they'll come in like knowing how the song goes ready. And what I always tell my students is, if, if you can't sing it, you can't play it, kind of thing. If they can't like sing the melody or sing the tune for the song, it's going to be very hard for them to play it and figure it out because they don't know it. But but in more like contemporary and like traditional teaching, students seem to actually know that part already. But I think the big element that could be taken out of Suzuki and bring in brought into there honestly would be maybe the parental involvement. Um, maybe not so rigorous, maybe not as as far as saying the parent has to learn as well. But even just the parent being involved in the lesson, just taking notes, that way they know what the student's doing. They know how the student's developing. They know what things maybe should they should be hearing and practicing at home, even if they're not doing it. Like just being able to hear like, oh, I want you to practice this exercise. Like play this song four times every day, saying the note names, for example. And have the parent be like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to make sure they do that. Um, even if it's not as like, even if it's not as like strict and as structured as a Suzuki lesson might be, at least it's something. And I think uh, students, especially young students, need that structure and guidance at home because um, they're, they're already doing so much when it comes to learning a brand new thing. Don't make them have to learn the structure of how to do it as well. I think having someone else there to guide them along the way is helpful. Very cool. And for our listeners at home going, oh man, the Suzuki method sounds really, really cool. I want to get involved. How do they go about... Uh, accessing a Suzuki program, becoming qualified or affiliate teachers? How does that sort of work? So one thing I think makes the Suzuki programs very, very good, but also may maybe a little bit of like a gatekeeping in a way is that in order to be qualified to take Suzuki Guitar Book 1, which is just songs that are like, with the exception of the last two, it's just single melodies. It's like single melodies using mostly the G or D scale. Nothing hard at all. You have to pass an audition, um, which you send in over video of you playing a piece from Suzuki Guitar Volume 4, which by that point you're playing, it's basically a standard classical guitar rep. It's something that anybody who has an undergrad in classical guitar could probably learn within a month or so. It's not impossibly hard, but it's not something that somebody who is like an amazing electric guitarist, let's say, um, could learn without like a good few years of serious classical guitar study. And I think the reason why for that is, because you have to have those, they have to know that you have those techniques down, you have good technique, you know how to get a good sound on the guitar before you go ahead and start teaching it. You know, there's definitely, it's a way to limit it, limit the people that can do it. So yeah, so if they want to get involved though, I guess the short answer is um, you want to definitely have, if you have no classical guitar experience, you want to take at least a year or two's worth of serious lessons with a qualified classical guitar teacher. If you're not sure how to do that, I would recommend first going to a local university and seeing if they have a classical guitarist teacher on staff and just sending them an email saying, hey, I'm a guitarist. I'd love to learn classical guitar, whether it's through university or through privately, but I really want to uh, learn this. 
Because at that point, you know the teacher is going to be somewhat qualified. You have a higher chance of them being qualified than going down to your local music store and trying to find a qualified classical guitar teacher for sure. Um, not that you can't, and I know tons of t- great classical guitarists that teach at music stores, um, but the likeliness is a little slimmer, definitely. If you already had the background, say you have a background in classical guitar, let's say you went and did your undergrad in classical guitar, then after that, you kind of put it down for a bit and you got back into electric guitar playing and teaching, then I would say pick it back up again, maybe take a few months of lessons to brush up your chops, maybe just refine your technique. You can go on to then the Suzuki Association of America's website. And you can look at their uh, teacher qualifications. You basically just set, fill out the form. You pay their registration fee. You submit your video. They have the, the guitar, the, well, I guess you can think of it as like the Suzuki Guitar uh, Council, or like board of directors. They all watch your video and they say, okay, cool. They pass, they pass, they pass. Once you get approved, then you're qualified to take Suzuki Guitar Book 1 and also the first preliminary course, which is a course called Every Child Can, which is a course that's just on understanding how children think, how they work, how certain things go. And once you do that, you pay for that course, you complete it, you pass it, you do all your like written exams, you play in the, the teacher performances, you have to do a certain amount of observation hours of teachers teaching. Then, technically, you're registered to teach Suzuki Guitar Book 1. And the, and the course you have to take is like a week long course. It's like a Monday through Friday, like 8 a.m. to like 5 p.m. every day kind of thing for a week. So it does, it does take up some time. Um, but you learn, a, you definitely learn a lot in the course and you're going to know those tunes, uh, inside it out and you learn them from someone who's been teaching them for at least 30 or 40 years. Very, very cool. And. What we'll do, guys, listening at home or watching at home, we will post the links to the Suzuki Association from America and a few other places around the world. So if you are interested, you can hit that one up and uh, get the qualification or at least explore a little bit more about this method. Now, John, there's a few other things I wanted to ask you about. Maybe going back to how much time do you have? I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Um, you know, I'm, pr- I'm pretty good on time, honestly. It's up to you and however much you want to include in the podcast. Fantastic. We'll we'll allude to the fact that we'll wrap it up uh, shortly, but guys, hang around because I might not have even asked the best questions yet, even though John's given us some amazing answers and some awesome, awesome insight uh, into Suzuki Method and everything we talked about earlier. But going back a little bit earlier, I know you're renowned as a classical guitar player. Uh, and I remember having one of our first discussions is I was saying something about classical and you were saying, no, 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 it's Baroque or it's Renaissance. So maybe expand upon the fact that Classical is an umbrella term, and there's actually lots of different subgenres and eras of music, which is generally just lumped in with the word classical. So, can you expand upon that a little bit? Definitely, yeah. I think that one thing that happens is I think people tend to lump classical in the same way that people lump might lump like rock music. They might think, and um, or better yet, because I'm, I'm definitely guilty of this, like lumping metal into all just like one big category. And if you talk to people that actually, I don't know if you'd like it, but if you talk to people that are like big metal heads, right, they're like, well, no, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this, and they're all so different. And I think classical there's music is the- called my music screamo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're calling every, yeah, so, yeah so somebody calling just all metal music screamo. But yeah, there's different kinds of um, classical music. And I think it, it, it all depends on finding what you like. I mean, there's stuff that- it goes way back. People think of like there's people when they think of classical, they think of the traditional Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and that stuff is classical. It definitely is a large element of what classical music is, but it's also only a small. It's only a small, small portion of like the whole thing. So, yeah, there's different time periods in classical music. There's like the as early as the Renaissance, which is like if you picture like maybe like medieval times kind of stuff, like things like kings and queens, all that stuff. And then there's the Baroque, which is totally different. It's definitely where things got much more, I like to say, almost mathematical sounding. And then after that, we have what would be as known as the classical, which confusingly enough is its own thing. So there's like, I guess, the classical era of classical music. But the classical era is where people start getting to know and be more familiar with people like Mozart and Beethoven. And then from there, we get into the Romantic era, which is kind of an involvement of the classical era, where things are much more lyrical, much more expressive. And then after that, we get into the modern era, which th- includes music that was written today, that some people might hear and not even know it's classical music. A big name in the classical guitar world is the name Andrew York. I don't know if you're familiar with that name. But he's somebody where I've never met a single person who doesn't like Andrew York's music. 
And the reason why is because it sounds very modern. It doesn't sound classical. You don't put it, you put it on and you're like, oh, this sounds like something that would be in like a movie soundtrack. This sounds like something that would be in a video game. And it's, it's really cool to hear somebody that thought classical music was this like one thing. And they're like, oh, wait, this is classical music. And then you show them like, like music by Via Lobos, who's like a Brazilian guitarist and composer. And in a way, that's classical music too, but it has more of a groove to it because that definitely is incorporating some of those folkloric Brazilian elements. You're like, oh, wait, so this is also classical music? Um, and yeah, it's definitely not this like one size fits all kind of thing. And I think you can definitely find a bunch of things in it that are cool. Very cool. Uh, Andrew York, does he do the piece and is he? He does. Uh-huh. That's it. Yeah. Okay. I, that's a fantastic that's, piece. That's, that's, that's a popular one. Yeah. Very, very cool stuff. And to go in a slightly different direction now, I recently watched one of your videos uh, about the Hal Leonard book and everything you said on that sort of criticism critique of it really resonated with me because I find that most of the big publishing companies, they're big, they're popular, they're consistent, but they just leave so much out or in my opinion are a little bit dated. So what do you think most traditional books like the Helm Method or the Mel Bay Method or the ones which a lot of guitar teachers teach out of and, of course, have gotten really good results with a lot of students for a long period of time, what do you think they're missing out on or they're getting wrong? I think my biggest thing, I mean, and you, you know from watching the video, but I think my biggest thing is like you do this method book, you work really hard and you only walk away with like being able to do something that to many is kind of just like almost sounds like an exercise at the end of the day. And um, I don't think I mentioned this in the video, but my, my overall thoughts when that all happened was like, if you're reading Hal Leonard and your goal, let's say, is to learn how to read sheet music, it's like, well, at that point, just learn classical guitar because you're going to learn sheet music a lot better. It's going to be much more complex and it's going to sound better too. So just do that if that's your goal. If your goal with guitar is to learn how to play like your favorite rock songs, your favorite pop songs, you're also going to be disappointed with Hal Leonard because you're going to get through it and you're, all you're going to be able to play is this like, thing that sounds kind of like an exercise at the end of the book and you would have been better off just like learning some chords on your own going on ultimate guitar looking up tabs and putting the same amount of work into that and you're going to be much much closer to your goal and i think that books like that don't really help students get to a certain goal at least one that's not used today i mean like you said it is definitely a pretty pretty dated um at least pretty dated in terms of like what's what they think of as relevant, like having songs like Surf Rock and like Rock and Robin. Um, although they're, they're cool songs and maybe at one point people recognize them. Not so much today. I, I have one friend who wrote a book, um, which I'm, I plan to use soon. It's called, it's called The Guitarist. It's like learning chords for guitarists. And what I took it as, right, which I think he took it as too, is he's somebody who has a background only in classical guitar. And later in life, he ended up learning how to play chords so he could accompany his church services and do like other kinds of gigs. And he made a book about kind of what he learned. And he very, very well, very, very clearly find, found songs that use two chords. And he talked about different strong patterns. He talked about ways to simplify the chords. Then he talked about chords, songs that have three chords. He talked about how to transition between chords. And at the end of the day, if you do that whole book, which is maybe like 50 pages, you leave being able to play like at least 20 songs, some older than others, but some songs like by Ed Sheeran, by song, people that, songs by people that, that people would know. And if they don't know, then people that other people would know. And I think. Um, if you're looking to learn how to play songs, you want to just get the guitar and play music you like, that's definitely a better approach than going ahead and trying to struggle through reading Ode to Joy and Hal Leonard. That definitely doesn't seem like a fun thing to do if that's not what you want, if that's not what you want to do. And then, like I said, if your goal, if, if you really say, oh, well, I really like reading stuff, it's make, it's, I just like it more, it's easier. I like reading the notes on the page and just go out and buy a classical guitar method book because you're going to get the same thing, but it's going to be much more impressive. It's going to sound better and it's going to leave you with better develop technique and better skills. Yeah. I think you've really hit the nail on the head when you said it really does depend on what the goal is. And when people, they hear ACDC or they hear Andesi or they hear Ed Sheeran and they go, man, I feel so inspired to play guitar. Then they go and buy one of those big publisher book companies. And all of a sudden they spend six weeks learning the first, you know, E, F and G and then B, C, D. And then, you know, they can play Old MacDonald How to Farm at Christmas time. No one's impressed and they feel kind of let down by the whole experience because it's not in alignment with getting them to where they need to go. So I, I think you've really hit the nail on the head with that point there. Just helping our students go, hey, why are you here? What are you hoping to learn? And what is a better vehicle to get you learning that kind of thing? 
but your uh, your friend's book sounds really interesting. So I'll let, uh, you, you say what you're about to say, <laughs> and I'll ask you. Another yeah, question. no, yeah, all, all I was going to say is I think that's one thing that makes Suzuki work so well too is because of the listening aspect. I think one thing I tell my students, the ones that are pretty young and that do Suzuki, is that they, at that age, many of them don't know what they want to learn. Like you ask a five-year-old, like, well, what kind, what do you like about guitar? What do you want to play? They're like, I don't know. I want to play guitar. And at that point, it's like, okay, well, cool. I'll let's do Suzuki because um, it will get you excited. And what's cool about Suzuki is they they listen to all the songs day one or day one, week one, month one. But what that does is because they know all these songs, as they're getting closer and closer to the songs, they get excited about the songs. They hear the older kids performing the same songs they're going to one day learn. And I think that's the same thing. It gets them – it helps build that excitement. You know, It's not just like, oh, cool, next song. What song is it? It's like, hey, your next song is this one. And then they're like, oh, I love that one. That's my favorite song. And it's like you have helped build that excitement for somebody that maybe doesn't have a connection to music, which is great. Very cool stuff. So would these uh, kids be at recitals or concerts or just by being in the, the studio? Is that where they're overhearing or they get like a CD where they would listen to the songs ahead of time? They like, get – um, kind of yeah, the, the, the Suzuki Book 1 comes with a CD which has all the songs in it and the part of the parent's job is to play that CD for them every single day. Very cool. Uh, I'm, I'm totally just going to pinch that for guitar ninjas. So I'm just <laughs> putting that out there, guys. All my guitar ninjas teachers just start rubbing their hands because they know that the audio tracks will be coming very, very soon. My last couple of questions for you, John, and I really appreciate all the wonderful things you're sharing with us. Um, your page for the classical guitar, it's got lots of great content. How do you go about creating content for your audience? By the way, guys, if you haven't got John's page on Facebook, uh, type in for the classical guitarist. And I believe that's the name of your YouTube channel as well. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. It's the handle for pretty much everything it's for YouTube, for Instagram, for TikTok, pretty much everything that you can, oh, not everything, but a lot of the large social media platforms that you can find. So if you found anything John's said today helpful, which I'm sure you have, make sure you like, subscribe, follow him on your social media platform of choice. We'll of course post all the links below for you to follow up on. Um, but John, yeah. How do you go about creating content with your audience in mind? You know, for me, what it was is what was, which is still the driving factor, is making content that I wish existed when I was learning classical guitar. Um, and my biggest realization was when I would go onto YouTube, maybe like five, six years ago, while I was still in college for for guitar, and look up and see tons of videos by like Paul David or Music Is Win talking about all these like fun things. I mean, like electric guitar seemed like this fun, cool thing. This thing there was there was a sense of community. There was a sense of like the culture of inside jokes of like top ten like BB King licks you gotta learn or like or like the most insane John Mayer solo. And those are the things that like, people seem drawn to that the total beginner can be like, oh, I want to learn that. Or, oh, I didn't know that it was that's a cool thing. I'm gonna spend all day like listening to that that John Mayer record. I'm gonna spend all day. Um, listening to that Chili Pepper solo. And my big thing was like, wow, that would be really cool if that existed for classical guitar. So that's kind of where I started making content for it and thinking about things that I thought that classical guitarists, more so beginners, people that don't know much about classical guitar could go and find out and get to know and learn about and feel encouraged about classical guitar and classical music. Because there's a lot of stuff and especially nowadays, at least here in the US, classical guitar is getting more and more popular in high schools. So much so that some states, not all of them, many states have like, um, they have like the, uh, I can't know what it's called, um, all state. They'll have like all state band, all state choir. And now some states even have all state guitar orchestra. We have to send in high schools, have to send auditions, playing scales, playing a certain level of piece. And then it becomes this equally as big of a thing as this. Like when you're in high school, it's like, well, should I sign up for band? Should I sign up for choir? Or should I do classical guitar ensemble? And it's definitely opening up the window from people that maybe didn't feel like they were comfortable enough to sing. Maybe if they felt like, oh, well, I don't want to do band because I don't like that kind of music. And they're like, oh, well, guitar and song, well, that seems kind of cool. And they go in and they learn classical guitar technique. Um, and yeah, I think those are the kinds of people that I want to make, definitely make content for because those are the people that, um, even if they don't walk away with it, they walk away being a professional classical guitarist at all. Um, at least they walk away with being like, oh, well, I'm part of the classical guitar community. I'm a, I'm a classical guitarist um, at whatever level they're at. That, that is so true that there was this whole world of rock guitar playing, electric guitar appreciation, online culture and really lacking in the classical regard. But that point of saying, hey, what do I, what do I wish I had had when I was starting out and going out and creating that I think is a great way to resonate with the audience and, of course, your students regardless of what genre you teach or for all the guys online listening to this who are looking at expanding into their own niche, that's definitely a rider downer. 
So, John, my final question today, and I appreciate everything and want to say thanks on behalf of our listeners and the whole team here at Top Music. If you could impart one final bit of wisdom, one final piece of advice for our listeners, primarily being guitar teachers, what would that be? Oh, that's, 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 that's tough because I think it's, there's so much stuff you could, you, could, you could, go, could do and say. But I think my biggest thing for guitar teachers would be understand that just because you're a teacher doesn't mean you can't still be learning. Um, a good example of this is for myself this past weekend. I went up to a guitar festival in Rhode Island, which is a state maybe like an hour and a half away from me. Um, and it was, the, it was great to just have a whole refresher, to get to go and see technique workshops, get to go and see clinics on like pieces and composers, um, get to go and watch other great performers teach classes to other students of all levels, and then get to see a handful of great concerts. And definitely left, I walked away definitely feeling very refreshed and very open to wanting to go home and work on certain things that I heard about or look up certain things that I learned about in passing. And I think that uh, one thing that happens as teachers, unfortunately, sometimes we get kind of stuck in a rut of like, well, I'm teaching this and this, like I'm teaching the same thing over and over. My students are all like the same level. I don't have anybody that's really pushing me as a teacher because sometimes we're not all so privileged to get that experience. And I think um, going out and put, putting yourself in a spot where you're definitely not no longer the best guitarist in the room or the best guitarist in the store or the school is definitely a huge way to kind of humble yourself, but also to leave yourself walking away, excited to teach again, because you were now put in the space where the student was, was, and you can go out there and continue teaching while you yourself are still learning. That's some really, really solid advice there, John. And I think we can all fall in that trap of, we often teach all day and then we got nothing left in the tank for our own enjoyment. We can sometimes fall out of love with the instrument or forget why we got into it in the first place or just get really complacent in our skills and abilities. And, you know, the more you learn, the more you discover, the less there is to discover. And some of that excitement about learning our instrument can sometimes disappear because there's not as much the world isn't as big as it was when we were 15 or 20 or early days. But I think you've said some really wonderful stuff there in terms of perpetually being a student and always looking for, you know, the next level, the next thing to work on and the next thing to play there. But John, thank you so much for guesting on the Top Music Guitar Teachers podcast. I've had the time of my life interviewing you and learning from you and your wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much for coming on. I'll definitely look forward to uh, hosting you sometime in the future again. And of course, one last time, where can our listeners find your stuff, like and subscribe to your channels? I think on any major social media platform, if you type in either my name, um, which is going to be listed in the title over here, um, or you can type in just for the classical guitarist, it should be one of the first ones that pops up. Um, and it shouldn't be too, too hard to find, I don't think. Um, if you type in both of them, double your chances. But yeah. Like and subscribe on all platforms there, guys. Double your chances, triple your chances. And of course, we'll post all the links. So guys, thank you once again for tuning in. If you're a guitar teacher doing something amazing in the online space or the offline music school, make sure you reach out. We would love to host you on the podcast and help more people get the knowledge that you have so they can improve their teaching, live better lives, run better businesses, and have a bigger impact on their students. So thanks, guys. We'll see you in the next exciting episode. Ta-ta for now. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, including a free ebook on how to find more guitar students, visit us at www.topmusic.co slash guitar or check out the show notes. And lastly, thanks again for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.